Hey, everybody, today is Monday, February 28th, 2022. Coming up on the show today, from the DC series Peacemaker, editor Fred Raskin. One of the things that was interesting about this entire process is I think under normal circumstances, I would have known everything that was happening every step of the way. But because this was all happening in the pandemic where everyone was working from home, a lot of stuff was happening without anyone being aware of it. Editor Greg Featherman. You know, it's a lonely job. You're here by yourself. You've got the material. You know the material's great. What have you done with it? And editor Greg Dorier. I have to tell you one of my most unprofessional moments. We're on the mixed stage for episode five. Yes, all that and a lot more on this edition of The Rough Cut. Okay, Monday is here. I know, not much to like about Monday. But hopefully this show helps a little with that. In fact, I think we have one today that will put a smile on your face. How do I know that? Well, because we are talking about James Gunn's Peacemaker. If you are not familiar with Peacemaker, I can tell you that it's a spinoff of Gunn's film The Suicide Squad and features Chris Peacemaker Smith, who I kind of thought died in The Suicide Squad. But thankfully, for HBO Max and for fans of superhero stories that blend Gunn's unique style of action, comedy, and even a little drama, Peacemaker is alive. Not alive and well, but alive. To bring Peacemaker to the streaming platform, Gunn had to look no further than his The Suicide Squad editor, Fred Raskin. Fred has worked and continues to work with Gunn on the Guardians of the Galaxy films. I think they're doing three right now. And Fred was on the podcast last year to talk about The Suicide Squad along with co-editor Chris Wagner. Once Gunn connected with Fred about Peacemaker, Fred reached out to two of his old friends and colleagues for help. One of them is Greg Featherman. That's Greg with two Gs. Well, wait a minute. Technically, it's three if you count the first G. Let's just say two G's and you'll know I mean two at the end. Anyway, Fred helped Greg two G's Featherman with the film 54. So they go all the way back to 1998 together. And to round the team out, Fred also called editor Greg Dorier. That's Greg with a single G. They worked on a few projects together, going back to Quentin Tarantino's Kill Bill Volume 1 in 2003. And then the two Gregs also worked together. So this is a crew with a history and a real appreciation for each other, which clearly comes through in this interview. Seriously, these guys need to lighten up. I probably edited out more laughter from this podcast than is normally in three episodes of the show. But don't worry, I left a lot in too. These guys definitely came to play, and Greg Dorier even brought props. So when you hear us laughing for what seems like no reason, it's because Dorier held up a sign that said, Dunno, ask them when I'd ask him a question. Editor and prop comic all in one. Not to mention a great podcast guest too. But you can hear all that for yourself in just a few minutes. First, let's give our friends who sponsored this show a little time in the spotlight. You know, when you're putting together a crew for a film... It's not all that different from putting together a black ops squad to save the world from an alien invasion. And you got to make sure that crew has team members who know how to make great music and move big media. And when it comes to moving media, you need to team up with our friends at Massive. They help you safely, cost-effectively, and efficiently share even the most enormous of media files that can result from you shooting all that high-res media. Other cloud-based file transfer solutions only let you share files up to a couple hundred gigabytes. Not Massive. With them, there are no limits to the size of the files you can share, and you can even do it through your own customized media transfer portal. No shipping drives all around, no complex servers to set up, plus Massive's pay-as-you-go model means you only pay for what you need. And as a member of the Motion Picture Association's trusted partner network, you can count on them to keep your media safe and secure. Finally, if you sign up today at massive.io slash the-rough-cut, you can get 100 gigabytes free towards your first transfer. I will put a link in the show notes to make it easy for you, but once again, that's massive.io slash the rough cut for 100 gigabytes free towards your transfer. And now that you have access to the very best way to share media amongst your production team, Make sure that you have the very best production audio to share as well. And for that, you know you can turn to our friends at Extreme Music. For over 20 years, they have been providing content creators in the world of media and entertainment with amazing music created by the top names in the production and composing game. You got Junkie XL, Bear McCurry, Shelby Lynn, Paul Oakenfold, and so many more big names to choose from. Just visit their website, ExtremeMusic.com, and do a quick keyword search on just about every aspect of music to find just what you need. Their powerful search engine even lets you use features like similarity searches to find tracks similar to ones you upload or link to. And once you find the tracks you want, you can customize them right down to the instrumentation so that you get just what you want in a way that suits your story best. You can take care of all that licensing right there online or with the help of one of their friendly representatives at an office near you. So do not wait. The next time you have a great story to tell, visit Extreme Music and get their musical superpowers on your movie-making squad. All right, time to get on with the learning, time to get on with the laughs. Here to make both of those happen are our friends from Peacemaker, editors Fred Raskin, Greg Featherman, and Greg Dorier.
didn't like the finale. Like, they loved the first half, and then they tuned out on the second half. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently Fred worked on the second half? You didn't even laugh. You didn't even fucking laugh. <laughs> <laughs> no, dude. Indeed. <laughs> well, Fred, I think I read that James Gunn said he conceived of the idea of doing the Peacemaker series while he was working on the Suicide Squad with you and, and of course, Chris Wagner. Did he talk to you about it while you guys were in post on Suicide Squad? And what did he say to you about the, the idea of Peacemaker? And what'd you think? He actually didn't really talk much about it while we were finishing the movie. It, it was really only when um, we were talking about, because, uh, you know, the, the movie had a tag that was planned, which is Weasel is still alive. And James at one point said, yeah, we're going to be doing something similar to that at the end of the credits with Peacemaker. <laughs> and I was like, oh, really? Because if you watch the movie, Peacemaker was definitely intended to die. He gets shot in the neck. He's bleeding out. <laughs> um, but James, uh, you know, had more to say with the character. And uh, from what I understand, I, I, I guess uh, the studio approached him and, and, and said, you know, are there any of these characters that you'd like to do anything more for in a TV setting? And he was like, actually, yes. And my answer might surprise you in terms of which one it is. Um, so, yeah, Peacemaker lived. Um, and, uh, and and clearly, I mean, it, it does kind of make sense because when you watch the movie, there's, there's that one moment where Idris Elba as Bloodsport is talking about his father torturing him, um, putting him in a, in, a, in a crate with rats and there's a cutaway to Peacemaker kind of nodding and half smiling and there's like there's like a knowing like that look there is sort of the setup for everything that happens in Peacemaker in terms of that character's backstory. Hey Fred mm -hmm. did you have any sense that the studio have any preferences for who they would have liked to have spun off into a TV series? I was not privy to any of these conversations. I mean, one of the things that was interesting about this entire process is I think under normal circumstances, I would have known everything that was happening every step of the way. But because this was all happening in the pandemic where everyone was working from home, a lot of stuff was happening without anyone being aware of it. When the show itself became a reality, it was a total surprise. Um, like when, when, when James said, I'm going to keep Peacemaker alive, like that was the first that I was really learning about it. Wow. But you're referencing the, the, the fake pandemic though, right? <laughs> <laughs> Pro wrestling is real. <laughs> For those keeping score at home, that's Greg Dorier talking. <laughs> <laughs> and while Greg Dorier is talking... You know, Greg, you and Fred go back a long ways, I think, to, to Kill Bill, Volume 1. I could be mistaken. Earlier. We actually uh, unofficially worked <laughs> earlier than that, yeah. What do you mean by unofficially? Fred, did you get a credit on Halloween H2O? You know, I don't think I did, but I, yeah, yeah. I, came, I came onto that for a month as an assistant editor, I think a film assistant. Correct. Suffice to say, you guys have known each other a while. Was it Fred that gave you the call about this project? And if whether it was or wasn't, what were you told about Peacemaker? <laughs> I just wanted to get that cheap laugh in one more time. Um, I, I remember, I remember exactly. <laughs> That's going to play great on the podcast. <laughs> oh, exactly. I'm all about audio. Let me tell you. I remember exactly when I got the phone call. I was actually uh, my oldest son and I had discovered in our neighborhood there was a taco truck that was fantastic. And it was on a Tuesday because we were walking up to get tacos, and my phone rings, and it's Fred. And Fred's like, hey, uh, how you doing? I'm, like, I'm doing fine. I'm going to get some tacos. He said, uh, you working right now? And I said, no, because this fake pandemic is going on. And he said, do you have any interest in, in working on Peacemaker? I think it took me about a millisecond to say yes, of course. And did he explain to you anything about the tone, about the story arc? I, yeah, I'll be honest with you. I, that part was a blur to me, quite frankly, because again, it, you know, he mentions that James is doing this series spun off from the Suicide Squad, which, of course, had not been out at that point, had not seen anything. But again, it's James Gunn. So you have me at James Gunn. So I'll be honest with you. I don't remember, Fred, if you said much about the specifics of the series with that initial phone call. That, that wasn't my recollection. I'm actually not certain that I had even read it at the time of that initial phone call. Um, okay. I, I think it was more, you know, we were, we knew that there, there were going to be three editors on the show. And so I reached out to you guys as people that I had worked with and known and really liked and got along really well with, though, though, though we hadn't worked together in this capacity. I assisted uh, two G's up there back in, 
was it 97 I, I, I think it was 96 is it new york it was new york it was on 54. Yeah, on 54. It was like 97 or 96 on 54. That's what I was wondering. But it ha- I, I didn't get out here until 98. So it had to be like 96 or 97. I think it was 97, Greg. Could have been. But it was it was right around then. Yes. Yeah. Do you have a credit on 54, Fred? You know, I have absolutely no idea. I don't think I do. <laughs> I didn't see the connection between you and Greg Double G. So that's news to me that uh, you guys are both on 54. But Mr. Featherman, when Fred gave you the call about Peacemaker. You know, it was very unusual because normally if someone asks me, you want to work on the show, I want to see the script. I want to know blah, 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 blah. Fred called up and he said, I'm doing this thing with James. And I said immediately, definitely. Then my next call was to my assistant to make sure he would do the job. And he said, well, did you read the script? I mean, what did you say? I said, I have no idea. I don't know anything. I know it's Fred and Greg. And that's all I, and James Gunn, and that's all I need to know. I just signed right up. So I've never done that, actually. But in this instance, it was a no-brainer. Okay, so for all of you then, at some point, I have to believe you did read a script. What were your general reactions to, oh my God, this is so out there? Anxiety. Because <laughs> uh, I, 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 uh, no, I, you, you're la- I'm telling you, it was around this time last year that I got access to all eight scripts. And first off, I'm semi-literate. I hate reading screenplays. So I sit down to read the first episode and I'm in my chair and I'm laughing out loud. And uh, as I'm, and so I read probably about two or three episodes at a sitting and I just became terrified. It's like, because the material was so funny. It was so ambitious and the story arcs for the characters were, were so well mapped out and went in places that I never knew it was going to go that when I finished reading the fantastic finale, I'm like, I'm going to get fired off this thing. Cause I, I'm going to, I'm going to fuck this up. You're laughing, Fred. I had anxiety. Like it, it, I'm like this thing again, as I was saying with Greg earlier, the tonal shifts sometimes on a dime that, I've never been on anything that that tried to pull off the type of tonal shifts that this series did and did expertly. And and in my mind, I'm like, oh, my God, what did I sign up for? You know, go get a a proper third editor. (laughs) Since you brought up those tonal shifts, I caught an interview with James recently. I think it was as the series wrapped. He was talking about the thing that he was most anxious about was editing the comedic aspects of the series. He's like, you know, action, no problem. But when it comes time to edit comedy, that's the part where you just really start sweating it. I mean, I I, I think from from my perspective, uh, the the way James uh, directs the the comedy scenes, like the dialogue in particular, he's written the script to the point where it's about as perfect as can be and will shoot the script exactly. And then we'll start throwing things out for the actors to to improv. Well, not exactly improv, because he's giving them a starting point, like say this, and they might riff on what he's saying. And then it kind of comes down to us to piece that together. There's really no better example than in the fifth episode, which 2G's cut, when Peacemaker is running through the list of names of people who Economos could have framed for the murder in the first episode. My hat is off to what Greg did there. Well, Mr. Featherman, since Fred brought that up, I'm going to jump right ahead a page here to you, Greg, in your episode, Monkey Dory, episode five, there's a great exchange between Peacemaker and Economos about uh, why Economos swapped in Peacemaker's father's fingerprints in the system in place of Peacemaker's. And as Fred just said, Peacemaker goes on this extended rant of all the people he could have used. Fred pointed out there's a lot of improv there. Um, you know, it could have been scripted, but he just goes on this extended rant for about four minutes. Oh, oh, you can't imagine. It, it's all, it was, there were basically like, I don't know, maybe five or six names in the script and all the rest were improvised. And they were, it starts out with John just doing them. And then when he, when he, he got a little exhausted. I mean, he exhausted a lot of names. I'm talking 30, 40 names. Then James would throw out more names. And then they would go back and forth and throw out more names. But really, cutting that, so much of it was really uh, John's rhythms. And he and, uh, and Economos, you know, they really, they really had a rhythm going. And it really wasn't, wasn't tricky because John provided the rhythm map. He sort of laid it out in his own rhythms. And that is why cutting the comedy scenes in this show 
unlike some other shows where people are not as talented or don't have the timing that John has, it was more straightforward because he, he really has an amazing sense of rhythm. And it was his sense of rhythm that guided me in cutting that. And what came out of their mouth was really, really, really well executed. It, I couldn't believe that he could improv that well. It just kept coming up with these names. And then James would throw out names. And honestly, it was, it was pretty straightforward. The talent on the set was off the charts. I have to tell you one of my most unprofessional moments. We're on the mix stage for episode five. And we sit down to play it for the first time. And several times during that episode, I'm just laughing out loud and not focusing on the task at hand. And obviously, that moment was one of them. And I felt a little comforted because I would hear other people on the stage doing the same thing. And then, and then you'd have to like, wait, I got to pay attention here because I need to focus on giving notes. But so many times during that episode, I, I just lost it. Fred mentioned that James has it so well scripted out and he is a very strong writer and you really have a great, even though you didn't read it when you said yes, you have these great roadmaps to go from. Is this the kind of scenario where you would use something like script sync because James has these great scripts that you want to make sure to follow, but at the same time when there's all kinds of improv, that can be a little tricky because you're going off script and having to manage those alternate takes. I don't use script sync in part because I have empathy for assistants that have to do that, because I had to do that on one show and wanted to slit my throat. It's an odious task. But when it's done for an editor, it's a fantastic tool. But I, over the years, I hate watching dailies <laughs> because I'm impatient. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, you know, I suck. I just like, can't the thing be put together and then I can just kind of like, you know, <laughs> shift pieces here. You I mean, I actually have to sit through all this, this stuff to figure <laughs> out what works and fail miserably before I, I get something that's somewhat decent. So over the years to force myself to really kind of focus on dailies, I'm, I'm a locator fiend. So tons of lines, I'm putting locators and putting little notes for myself about inflections, whether or not I like it. Um, I've lost my way. What the hell am I answering? What was your question, Matt? Hold up your sign. Well, if you had script sync, you'd be able to go right back to it. <laughs> yeah, you're right. That, yeah, thank you. Here we go. <laughs> um, I use script sync in my, in, I cut more television than my associates and, um, it's more, there's more time pressure. And so I use script sync in dialogue scenes when I'm cutting stuff for TV. However, this show, we had a little more time. And um, if I can avoid what I, I like script sync for is for revising stuff. Do I have an alternate read of that? Then it's so handy to just go and get it. So often when you're cutting a scene, especially, you know, looking at the film in front of you, it's not the dialogue as much as it might be a reaction or other nuances that really determine how you want to cut the scene. So you really you really want to look at the film. And I have to say that in, in this show, as much as the improvs were great, I didn't use it to cut with, and I did not have the improvs in my script scene. So when I, when I went to do that thing in scene five, they weren't there. But, you know, for that, which was an extended improv and went on quite a ways, it really wasn't necessary. I mean, it, the stuff was, was there. It was in rhythm. And, uh, and you really didn't need it. But it is a phenomenal tool, and I use it on a daily basis. And I, I introduced it a little bit into this show figuring that it would help my uh, colleagues when they went to do revisions. Yeah, I'd never used it before. And Greg Featherman was, was talking about how helpful it would be upon revisions. And I got to say, when it came to that improv stuff, having it in there when, when we went, went back, because you could have an improv line that they would then try multiple versions of over the course of like a 17 minute take, being able to track down when they did that specific improv was incredibly helpful, as opposed to having to sift through all of that footage. Hey, hey Greg, can I circle back, though? For uh, I'm curious. Uh, so you said, obviously, that John had the rhythms for, for all those various names that he's throwing out there. Oh, yeah. I had to adjust it, of course. But, but he would go on pretty good runs. Um, and then it was a question of, putting the other stuff in, putting Economos in. It was also a question of, there wasn't much of Economos responding to him. There was him going off forever. I mean, forever from all different angles. It, it was incredible, but there wasn't much of Economos responding. So the first thing I did was sort out what pieces I was going to use of Economos and Harcourt and other people responding. I had those in a whole sequence of, you know, it, 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 
so that was the trick. The rhythm really wasn't as much John going off as um, as as how the other people were going to respond, and that's where you could sort of make the adjustments in the rhythm. It just wanted to sound continuous, and and that was the that was the the trick. I've got to say, John Cena threw out so many names that while we were on the mix stage, <laughs> we had to cut one of them out because one of the people whose names he threw out had just died. That's an experience that I've not had before. You remember that feeling, Fred? Like all of us on the mix stage, we all, yeah. <laughs> Matt, it, it, it was it was visceral when that name popped up, and all of us viscerally reacted right then and there. I've never had an experience like that on a mix stage either. This might be the first time that a show about the people making the show might have rivaled the actual show itself. <laughs> and I got to say, Greg Dory, I've interviewed a lot of editors. You're the first one that's ever said, I don't read scripts and I don't watch daily. Wait, wait, that, that, that's fake news, Matt. Wouldn't be the first time. Uh, exactly. A, I do read scripts. I'm just terrible at reading them. And B, I do watch dailies. I'm just terrible at watching them. I'm just terrible. I was just going to use all that to lead to what a gifted editor you must be in spite of all that. So there was a compliment hidden in there somewhere, Chris. But Somewhere my agent is mortified right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, the one who doesn't read scripts? Oh, yeah. He's really great. I'm so proud to represent him. <laughs> I have a question about the overlap between Suicide Squad and Peacemaker in terms of chronologically, because Fred... When we were having that discussion about the Suicide Squad and Chris was on there, I believe Chris said that James asked him to do a promo for Peacemaker, to which Chris said, hey, I don't do that. I'm going to suck at it. And and he turned out to be right. He did the promo and it was terrible. And somebody else had to redo it. But that begs the question, what was Chris editing with? Was there anything actually shot for Peacemaker or was this all just outtakes from Suicide Squad. Uh, I mean, it, it wasn't even outtakes. I think a lot of it was stuff that was in the movie. It was, it was, it was, uh, if, if memory serves, it was just kind of a, uh, something to give you a sense of who Peacemaker the character is, kind of as presented in the Suicide Squad. Um, uh, it, it, it never, I don't, I don't think anything ever really materialized from it. Like, I, I don't think it went off to anyone else to do. I think it was just sort of, I think what it actually became was the scripts really spoke for themselves in terms of what the show is, you can get a sense of what Cena brings to the role in the Suicide Squad. And there's definitely some improv that he did. And so that would give you a sense as to what you're going to get. But I think that Peacemaker, the show, is a pretty different animal from the Suicide Squad movie. It's a more intimate thing. It's more focused on character. You have the time to do that. So ultimately, I think the piece that he was cutting was never going to really accurately reflect the show that, that it became. Hey, Fred. What was sort of either the biggest surprise or revelation for you working on the series relative to what you thought Peacemaker was when you were cutting John in the Suicide Squad? I mean, we got a surprisingly great sense of his dramatic chops in the Suicide Squad. It really all just kind of sprung from the things that he did on set in the Suicide Squad. I, 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 re I remember specifically, he would come up with these real, like, improv zingers and i i remember hearing um some of the producers talking about it saying he must be preparing these the night before like as as like like he he, get, he gets all his lines ready and then he comes up with things that he's going to throw out as improvs um and and that like pretty clearly was a jumping off point for what he would do in this show there's a moment toward the end of the Suicide Squad when Peacemaker has the gun on Ratcatcher 2 and, and he's getting ready to kill her and he clearly doesn't want to, but also doesn't feel like he has a choice. And you can see that conflict in him. And it's like, wow, he's a really gifted dramatic actor. And so everything that you see in the show kind of stems from that and obviously goes much deeper. We've got him legitimately crying at numerous points during the course of the show. And his comedy skills are like second to none. It's just, I mean, it's hilarious to think that someone who prior to this was really best known as a professional wrestler should be such a gifted, both comedic and dramatic actor. You know, one of the things I was curious about was the difference, the comparison of working with James on a film and your workflow with him on that versus working in television. So it's kind of a two-parter. There's how does it differ working with James? Then also just, you know, Greg Featherman, your experience working in TV series versus any feature work you might've done. I've done both. And this was definitely a hybrid situation. It felt like a hybrid situation in several respects. One of them was um, the quality of 
film I received, which was just outstanding. And not just from the principals, but also uh, the stunt work, for example, is just unbelievable. I mean, I would just watch it and just be in shock at how good these guys were. And the fighting sequences, they were off the charts. So that there, there was the quality of the stuff coming in, which was superior to you know, your average TV shoot, let me just say. And also, there was more time allowed, uh, definitely more time allowed to prepare the sequences. Now, that was appropriate because this was more complex material and definitely needed more sound work than, again, than, than what's typical on TV. But still, it, it was there and it was accounted for. So I felt in general that, you know, that doing this job was a hybrid. It sort of had elements of working in features uh, of enormous quality uh, uh, of, of so many of the people involved and a little bit more time than I'm used to getting in certain TV environments. The way that I worked with James was all by notes. It was all by, by written notes, which was, I think, more, I don't know, Fred could speak to this more having worked with James uh, on so many other things, but I think this was more a, a thing about the pandemic than a feature versus TV. James was so busy. I, I can't believe the work this guy does. I mean, it's unbelievable. He wrote these shows. He's directing these shows. He's finishing a feature. The guy's incredible. So the idea that he's doing all this stuff. So, so his time was really, you know, the thing. So when he had the time, he would send the notes. And so it was, it was all done by notes, which I think is, is partially the pandemic and partly his time management. Yeah, I mean, it's it certainly is pre-pandemic. James would have been coming into the editing room, and and he would have been looking at things with us and giving notes uh, in person. And I think there's an aspect actually of this that I think he probably prefers, which is that it doesn't have to be an off-the-cuff response. We would send out cuts with a time code burn in in them, and he would send us notes back that were very specific. Like at this time code, I want to see a different performance on on this line. That type of thing, uh, where he would really just go through every. Everything. And, and that was born out of the pandemic when we were forced to be working at home. That was how he would give notes on stuff from the Suicide Squad. And obviously, when he was off shooting in Canada, it was the easiest way for us to interact. And that's basically how it went for the duration of the show. I think actually, we really only had FaceTime with him during the visual effects reviews and when we did playbacks of the episodes for the composers. Greg and I had been on the show for months before James actually met us. And he, he met us over a VFX Zoom meeting in which James immediately was like, oh, there's hippie Greg and there's clean cut Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> yeah, I totally do. Yeah. But, uh, uh, but also to sort of chime in, his notes, as Fred was saying, were incredibly specific because, you know, I would say to you know, people would ask me what was it like working with James? And I would say, well, it was all through email. And their initial response would be, God, that's got to be so difficult. And I would say, you would think it would be, but it wasn't because he knew what was working or what, or, or what needed to be done. Like there was never a note that was like, this isn't working, figure it out. He always would tell you what he was looking for with the note. And again, as Fred said, it would be time code specific to the sequence that you sent. So you were never, at least for me, I don't know about you two, there was never a note that he gave that I was scratching my head going, I can't figure out what this man wants. And, and the fact that I, I was never in a room with him and had never developed any kind of shorthand with him, it blew me away how efficient the process was. Because it, by all standards, it, it seems like it, it never should have worked as well as it did, but it did. Well, you know, other than just how you each interact with James, what about communicating between the three of you? As little as possible. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like these guys. Don't read the script. Don't watch the dailies. Don't talk to the other editors. I got it. I think you've got Greg figured out there. Yeah. Clearly. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think you pretty much nailed it there. We would, I mean, it, it was actually really nice that we had each other to, to, to bounce our scenes off of, um, that, that we could say, Hey, what, what do you, I'm, I'm going to, I'm getting ready to send this to James. What do you think of it? Um, and, and, yeah, I mean, honestly, something that would have happened if we were all in a cutting room together, but because we're all working remotely, it was just open up your transfer bin and take a look at what's in there and let me know what you think. And I'll just jump in for a second, it, 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 being serious for a moment. It, it's something I, I, I responded to a post that Fred put on Facebook. 
I love these guys. I've loved working with them. I've worked with them in the past. They're incredibly talented, but they're even better people. Like I, I, I like Greg Featherman and I, we haven't been in touch for a few years. So when I found out that Greg was going to be on board, I immediately called him and we just started yakking. And, and I, I think the first phone call was like an hour long. And we ended up talking about the Clippers because we love basketball. But again, there was an anecdote, Peter Brown, our sound supervisor, uh, one of the last days that I was on the show, on the show, um, we were, at, we were in the break room where we were mixing the show and Peter is saying, this is all too good. Something bad has to happen. I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, well, you know, the, the work is so great and you know, the people are such a joy to work with that this, uh, it, it can't it can't be this good from beginning to end. And it was the first time like Peter made me paranoid. I'm like, Oh shit. Is he on to something? Because again, I, these two guys, I love, and, and I loved working with them on the show. Obviously we love the material and we were all proud of the end result. And I'm like, am I deluding myself? Is this, is this going to be a train wreck? So the, the fact that, that it, it was so well received this was one of the the best experiences I've ever had professionally from beginning to end. And I I, got to say kind of on top of that, I I agree with everything you've just said, but one of the things that was really interesting about this job is, is that we were experiencing the finished episodes kind of together. And we all, we all knew that the show was good just from, from reading the scripts. We all, we all liked the scripts that we read. But when we saw it all play out with with all of the elements together, seeing the massive tonal shifts play out in front of you is not the same as when you read it in the script. And we all collectively, like when one of us finished an episode, like we would all watch it and then kind of talk with each other. And every time, every time we were all like, this show's really good. Like we were all kind of like, it was just a really nice experience, but we all kind of were the first audience for the show. And I remember specifically, Fred, very early on, once you started cutting those initial episodes, we'd had some conversation and you were talking about what we're getting is exceeding the scripts. And, and I was like blown away. But to Fred's point, and, and Greg, you can chime in, the scripts were between the filmmaking and, and, and the cast. You could tell the cast knew that they, that they all were gifted something really special with all of their characters and what James was doing. Like every part of that team had an arc that was being crafted and they all knew it. It really was pretty spectacular to to see it unfold. I want to comment on what both of you guys said. I want to say that it's a funny kind of thing because I love these guys too. And it's not like LA love, you know, I love, you know, it's like, (laughs) Like, like, no, like we've been really good friends for years, years. And so to get to work together, this is why I said we, I took the job in, in a millisecond. As soon as Fred said you went, because I wanted to work with these guys again. And also the enormous pleasure of being able to send scenes to each other, which I, I just thought was great. I love the idea that I could, that I could cut a scene and, and send it out and get comments about it. It was really great. And it, if there was ever any level of anxiety about what I was going to turn in, it would be diffused pretty quickly because I would get feedback. And it was super, super, super helpful. And also, you know, when you're editing, you know, it's a lonely job. You're here by yourself. You've got the material. You know, the material's great. What have you done with it? Is it working? There's no one to show it with. You know, my, my assistant's there, but he's, you know, he doesn't, you know he's kind of low key. I want to know. And also I want, if, if, it, if, if there's real notes, I want to hear the notes. If there's tricks. I want to know about it. So I, I found this to be a great thing. And also between us, there's, there's only good vibes. So for me, this was an enormous professional pleasure that I could take a fight scene and send it out and get notes. And I want to jump in for a second to thank both of these guys. Cause I assisted both of these guys. And in part, I'm doing what I'm doing now because both of these guys were generous, both with allowing me to do a little bit of cutting on things that they were working on, A, but B, they would always bring me in and ask for feedback on their cuts. Always. And sometimes you're like, well, not with these two guys, but in general, you're always like, 
am I allowed to kind of be honest or, or does the editor just want back padding? And so the dialogue that I would have with these guys informed my aesthetic. And, and, you know, I learned so much working with these guys. And that's part of what I'm saying about my memories of, of assisting them were joyful and, and I've stolen techniques from both of them. So thank you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Greg, you and I don't go back all that far. I, I'd say it about 40 minutes now. Um, in the time that we have spent together. You've had enough I, of me. I have to say that if you assisted Greg Featherman, clean cut Greg, at one point, there is no way that any of his assistants moving forward could be considered anything but low key. So there you go. You know, I do also, I need to acknowledge that getting the first episode finished was a priority and it was sort of fast tracked so that the directors of the later episodes would get a really solid sense as to what the show was going to be and understand the style of it. So I fell way behind on the second episode while I was finishing the first. And so I have to acknowledge my first assistant, Todd Bush, I threw a lot of scenes his way that he put together and enough that I felt very comfortable giving him an upfront editing credit on the second episode because he really did a terrific job with uh, all, all, all this, this, the stuff with uh, with Evan and Amber, the neighbors who uh, Peacemaker takes hostage like that was that was all cut by Todd, along with the uh, the little montage at the end of the second episode. We just had a really great team all around, like not just us editors, but our assistants as well. And and Brian Carroll, and you know the um, yeah, I, yes, about. yeah. And and that's 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 something that also I, we have to acknowledge. Greg mentioned having a little bit more time on this than you normally would have in TV. Brian was regularly updating our schedule, and we ended up with a lot more time on the mix stage than I think we would have had on any normal show. Yep. I think the the sound work on the show, I think it's exceptional. Our mixers, Joe Barnett and, and Adam Jenkins, did a phenomenal job. And Brian was was very cognizant of how much more complex this show was than a lot of other shows and talked to the network and, and got us the amount of time that we needed to mix these shows properly. I mean, we weren't like it wasn't like a feature where we had like two months to do a final, but it was the the right amount of time. Whereas I think other shows of this nature would only have had maybe three days. We had a minimum of five days. And I, I think the uh the the season finale may have had eight. It was uh, well uh, worth it. Yeah, totally. And I, and I just want to chime in as well, throwing a little love. Rachel Watson, who was my primary assistant, especially in terms of sound. The way I work with assistants is I'll sort of talk about what I would like for sounds, but they go off and do all that. And she did phenomenal work. All in all, she did phenomenal work. But like a lot of the sound temp work that she did was a fantastic guideline for our sound team. So tip of the hat to Rachel. She was fantastic. The, the whole team was fantastic. So you guys love each other. <laughs> you love the show. You love the whole team. What I love <laughs> is the open. <laughs> if we talked about nothing but the open for this show, it would still be time well spent. I can't think of another show where I didn't eventually start hitting that skip intro button. In fact, I, HBO Max keeps a stat on how often the audience clicks that skip intro button. It has to be almost a zero for Peacemaker. So please tell me that one of you, all of you, cut that open. Fred cut it. And and Fred. it's so spectacular. I have to say, like, I, you know, I never watch the opening of a show I work on. I mean, I just, you know, of course I never watch it. I watch it every fuck every time. Every you single can't, time. You can't. Wait, you can't curse? I don't know. Of course you can. I, I watch it. Okay, it, right? I watch it every fucking time. I mean, I loved watching. I would kind of look on the timeline and see when it's coming up, because, and I still do. I mean, I just think it's great. I, I think it's great, and it doesn't get old for me. And my wife keeps showing me these clips of people who are doing the dance in their house, <laughs> like like actual people, you know, viewers who are doing the dance, and it's just spectacular. So I, I, I take my hat off to Fred. <laughs> Two quick anecdotes, and we'll let Fred take all the glory because he should. One, as I said, we had friends and family over every Friday night to watch Peacemaker, and it was hysterical watching all of the women 
when, <laughs> I, and I'm not joking. And and like they were they were Wait, like just, for those that are only listening to this. Oh, I, Greg, Greg was sort of pantomiming the the dance routine, right? <laughs> and, and every single episode, they would click in and start doing the dance moves. And it, I, I can't tell you because it was real. Like they didn't have to do that if they didn't want to. And I specifically said, look, guys, I didn't cut this episode, so we can we can skip. You know, I, we don't need to see who who fucking cut the episode because we don't care. And they, of course, wanted to. Nobody's laughing. I, I, I <laughs> I'm laughing. OK, that joke just bombed. But anyway, at, like it was so joyful to watch them do that every single time. And the other anecdote is toward the end, Fred, uh, you know, Fred also, much like James Gunn, um, was balancing multiple episodes in a little movie called Guardians of the Galaxy 3. So, I, you know, he was he had it pretty easy. So there was a little stretch where there there were some issues that need to be ironed out with credit placement. Right. So that task got handed over to me. And that in and of itself is, you know, no one dreams of having to deal with, you know, card placements. I never got tired of that sequence, even though I'd be like, oh, this fucking, oh, wait, now I got to take this card and move it here. But I'd find myself going, fuck it, I'm just going to watch the, you know, because it it was just so much fun. So those are my two little anecdotes about the brilliance of the opening. <laughs> Fred, that's a hell of a buildup. Yeah. The stage is yours. No, I mean, you know, I uh, I was a theater kid in high school and, uh, and, and I've always dreamed of getting the musical. I've never had the opportunity, but at least I got this uh, this choreographed dance number that's probably the closest I've come. The footage was terrific. Like shout out to James for having the concept and for uh, uh, Carissa Barton, who choreographed the whole number and the cast who was completely game for it and like would practice on the weekends. And, and I mean, the the whole thing I think was shot in one day and I think it took me two days to cut it but it's something that we talked about often the three of us as we as we were cutting the episodes when we were watching an episode back to, to see how it was playing I'd watch it. we never skipped it right, never. We'd, we'd always watch it through <laughs> like it's just a blast um, and and I love actually how it ultimately pays off in the show you don't realize that you're being taught this song so that when it reappears in the finale it, it pumps you up that much more well, how do you feel knowing that you single-handedly, and I wouldn't even say reinvigorated because I don't think they ever had a career, but invigorated the career of Scandinavian glam metal band Wigwam just because you made this amazing opening dance number? <laughs> I'm not going to say single-handedly because I think James probably deserves more credit than me. But <laughs> Fair enough. But, uh, but, but I, I will say it truly like... I'm incredibly proud of that having happened. Like that this band who, I, I don't know how, how much your, your listeners know the story of this band, but their booking agent dropped them three days before the show premiered. Um, like they were, they were done. And literally within two weeks, they were planning a North American tour. Um, like like a, a, a Norwegian band that basically no one like in this side of the world had heard of. Um, people are clamoring for them to come and tour. Well, I hope when they hit L.A., they let you introduce them. That would be awesome. <laughs> my my two-year-old daughter is in love with their stuff. She sings their songs all the time. I'm not joking. <laughs> so why don't we talk about uh, music a little bit? You know, that song, as well as pretty much all the songs in the film, are of that 80s hair metal, glam metal. You know, for James, he seems like the kind of director that would have a very strong sense of what he wants musically. As you said, he scripted it into the finale. But did he come to you guys with a playlist at hand? Were you able to play around a little bit with Needle Drops? Uh, within that genre, those songs were in the scripts. Yeah, I, I, I would say ninety-eight percent of them were. There, there were yep. there were a few moments where uh, a scene went on longer than than a song lasted, um, and uh, and James had a couple. I want to say may, maybe eighty songs, uh, like of. This is random stuff that I did not include in the scripts, but that we can use throughout the show if we need to. And so uh, I remember specifically in, in, in the first episode, uh, there's a scene in the sports bar. Um, there's one song that was scripted, and then, uh, but the song that actually starts the scene is a song by a band called Y&T. Summertime Girls is the name of the song. That one in particular, like Y&T, I know is a pretty well-known hair metal band if you're if you're into that stuff. Um, and and like immediate when I saw that. 
them on the playlist. I was like, oh, I've got to get a Y&T song in here. So, <laughs> so, so, so I tried that one out and James really liked it. And so that one stuck. So, but but I mean, pretty much everything else with maybe one exception was was uh, was all all in the script. The scripts actually came with a playlist. Yeah. In other words, they were not two separate things. The music was really central to the conception of the script so that you'd get the script and you'd get a playlist. And then there were these bins that had like the A list, the B list and the C list of of other stuff that James had selected. James selected everything, even if it wasn't in the script. It was still from his collection that you could pick from. And it was so much fun to listen to these songs. So as someone who I have to admit, I I listen to jazz sometimes, which, you know, um, you know, uh, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) right. It was it was such a pleasure to listen to these songs and go through these bins. So anyhow, but but they, the, the scripts actually came with a playlist for each show. Then, Matt, just to uh, clarify, when when Greg is talking about jazz, he is talking about Kenny G. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the music uh, in particular, because uh, I we knew which episodes we were going to cut. I was terrified in in episode four when I read the script. I was terrified of the House of Pain montage, and I was terrified of the monster montage in episode six. Like th- those specifically uh, gave me a great deal of anxiety. House of Pain. Never have I worked on something that 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 was so applicable to the experience of doing it. <laughs> Not that it wasn't a great sequence, but it was a very hard song. Every time there was a change, it was not an easy, you couldn't just chop it up and dissolve or anything like that. It was as much of a challenge as it it was to tell that story, you know, through the pictures. It was an even greater challenge to make certain that the song still worked. And I remember in particular, at one point, because I had done a, a ham-fisted music edit, and James just shot it down. He's like, this music is not working. And I remember just, you know, going into the corner and crying because I was like, how am I going to figure this out? Um, and then it became pronounced when, uh, you know, we finished it. And then um, we had a cast change. And I had to go back in and revisit my house of pain. So the, that that sequence, again, I'm incredibly proud of it. And it wasn't that the, like, I wasn't doing triage on it. It was all fantastic material. It was just, that thing was a, a high bar to have to make certain that, that you kept. And so... Yeah, I mean, because you'd you'd finish a, a a cut of one of these sequences, and it's it's all timed very specifically to the song, and then you got to go make back and make changes, <laughs> and you 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 had to you had to both. I, I mean, I really had to flex my my music editing skills. Um, like th- those muscles had had to, had to get flexed as well as picture editing. I mean, it was a massive challenge. Uh, making changes on on a sequence like that was pretty daunting. Like there there were many times when 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 <laughs> yeah, I, Greg Greg would just break out his guitar and 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 rewrite the song. But for those of us who don't have those skills, <laughs> exactly, I would just play an E chord, and that would motivate me to figure out how to cut the fucking thing. You know, you mentioned there being a cast change in your collective experience. Is that something that happens with a fair degree of regularity where you've worked on something so hard and then all of a sudden, hey, we got to make a change here. And guess what? All that work just went out the window and you got to, well, not all of it, but a lot of it went out the window and you got to start over. That's going to be a pretty painful experience. Uh, it was a house of pain experience. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't know about you guys. I never experienced anything like that. And, you know, it actually surprisingly wasn't as much of a challenge as I thought it was going to be. Again, because James wrote it and James knew what he wanted. So at first I felt like, okay, I've already, you know, I've already climbed this hill, you know, and the Sisyphus experience of getting knocked down and having to go back up it. That's what I thought. It wasn't as much of a challenge as you would have thought to have to go back up that hill. Because in in particular in episode four, there were a lot of interesting tonal scenes to have to play between those two actors and 
when James did it again with the new actor, there weren't that many takes because James knew what he wanted and, and Freddie hit those zones pretty quickly. It was actually enlightening the cast change because you just got to see how two actors were going to play the same material. And it would have been painful. But again, in this process, we had enough time to cut it. And there were a lot of scenes because there are a lot of group scenes, you know, with lots of people in them. But actually, we had the time. And I thought it was really interesting to see how one guy plays it, how the new guy would play it and working them in. And the pain was greatly minimized by the fact that we had enough time to actually execute it. That made it, for me, more of an enlightening experience rather than, than, than a painful one. It's such a it's such a such a fun show, such a brilliant show for each of you. Is there a scene or an episode that you had the most fun cutting and why? For me, it's the uh, action finale when the Do You Want to Taste It song comes back. That whole sequence was, I mean, uh, just a blast. And something that I approached a little differently than I think I normally approach action. I, I laid the song down first oh. um, and, and cut the scene on top of it. Wow. Wow. Um, you see it primarily in the opening as they're all like approaching before the action starts. Those cuts are all very specifically on the beat of the song. I mean, like I mentioned earlier, when I had to go back and make changes, those things would become nightmarish. But in that sequence, I don't think any of that ever really changed. There were some changes that happened internally, but that whole opening stayed the same pretty much from beginning to end. Um, I really came to love the song. And so like, I never tired of it. <laughs> I, I definitely, definitely rewatched that sequence more times than anything else in the show. Don't fuck with my BFF. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so ridiculously violent and fun and, and great to see like the characters all working together. Like just from the perspective of we followed them this far in their journey getting to see them all fighting alongside each other was a thrill. And so getting to put that together was equally thrilling. Uh, for me, two scenes. Um, in episode four, the scene with Peacemaker and Augie in the prison. Because for me, that's the point in the series that you would look at Peacemaker differently after that moment. And that, that scene, again, with tonal shifts, but if, you know, some of what Augie says is so vile and harsh and um, the two of them, I, I thought just nailed it. But then I'm always bad at remembering exactly the lines of dialogue, but something like, you know, when Augie says, you're comparing yourself to a little cock and John goes, not in a bad way. <laughs> and, 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 and so coming off, you know, how uncomfortable that exchange is, what they're saying, that James would write that and that John would nail that moment. Um, again, that that's kind of, you don't get scenes like that very often. Uh, and I was, I was really proud about how that scene it ended up. Uh, and then the other, because I'm, more than anything, um, I love moments. Uh, I, I find, for me, like, in The Godfather, my favorite moment is when Michael leans back in the Chase Lounge after he has that conversation, you know, with his dad about, we'll get there, Pop, we'll get there. And I and this series is chock-a-block of really great moments. I mean, there's there's a wonderful moment in episode three with with Peacemaker and Harcourt, in particular, where I think she catches herself like, oh my God, I think I'm starting to have feelings for this guy. And then she has to shift and say, can I go to the bathroom? There's a wonderful moment. I'll get to the answer in a, in a moment. I just, there's a wonderful moment in five where, um, you know, where, where they come back after, you know, chainsaw and the gorilla and everything. And, and Mern's like, you guys have earned a day off and Harcourt just has that look and, and Mern's like, you okay. And she's like, yeah, those are the things for me that give it more life because once I, I know the narrative, I already know the narrative. So what, what's the texture that makes, you know, makes me want to keep coming back? And that's throughout the show. The other scene that I really loved because I was also blown away was when John played the piano uh, at the end of episode six. Because when I played the first take of it, I'm like, okay, so it's playback. 
And then I play a second take and I'm like, oh, wait a second. The tempo is slightly off. Oh, wait, he just, is this fucking guy playing the piano? And then I play a, a, a third take and it, it's a little bit different again. I'm like, fuck this guy. He, he, he can play piano. James shot it beautifully. And um, John's performance as he's playing this song, you sense him reconnecting to what this song means, which of course we're going to find out exactly what it means uh, at the beginning of the next episode. Um, again, that's, that's just a scene of, of moments. And, uh, I, I was really, I was really, I felt very lucky to get to cut that scene. I was pretty happy with how it turned out. Yeah. You did a great job with it. There were so many great moments in the show that it, it's hard to, it's hard to pick, but for me, the dialogue, you know, I, there, there, I'm, there, I'm going to give you two, two, two pieces. One was uh, the, um, the thing in scene five where he does all the names, which was really fun to cut. And that was James's idea. Originally, I thought we were going to be using it at the end of the show. And James said, well, let's put it right in the scene. And that was just so much fun to cut. It was just crazy fun for a dialogue scene. And then for the other thing that I just love cutting was the judo master fight with Harcourt. Yes. I think it's in seven. Yes. I mean, first of all, all the stunt work was thrilling to just to see it. I mean, like the gorilla fight when they go back, but cutting that judo fight, I was just so impressed with the quality of the work and how amazing these stunt people were, and also how how beautifully executed the whole thing was, the photography, I mean, putting it together. It was just, it was so much fun. So th those would be my two, but, but there were countless beautiful moments in the show, really great performances. When Harcourt is, is sort of running up the side of the wall during that amazing. fight, was, was, right? it was so fucking fun. Crazy, yeah. crazy. And, and just, I mean, slamming her head. I mean, the whole... For me, it, it was just so much fun. And it was also easy because the material was so good. It was so well choreographed and so well planned that it was extremely straightforward. And I got to watch it happen kind of quick in the cutting room. And it was so much fun. And we have to we have to give a shout out to Judo Master. Oh, uh, every, incredible. every time he entered the show, the energy of Judo Master was amazing. And for me, hands down, my favorite thematic element is that judo master whistle. Every every time that would come up, I would just smile. Uh, again, judo master with the Cheetos, it, it, you know, down in the dungeon. <laughs> incredible, <laughs> it, fucking incredible. incredible. And, and and you know, the the first fight, you know, where judo master finishes off vigilante, and he just yeah! it was just fucking phenomenal. Fair to say that Fred is the judo master of the peacemaker <laughs> editing crew. <laughs> That's how I see it. Um, <laughs> Greg, you did mention something there that, that I think does bear acknowledgement because so much has been made of all of the hair metal that, that I think the composers on the show don't get the credit that they deserve. And they should. Um, um, yeah, Clint Menzel and, and, and Kevin Kiner um, really did a phenomenal job coming up with real like thematics. Like there's there's an Adebayo theme Theme. like for her relationship with peacemaker that there's there's a as 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 greg mentioned the, the the whistle when judo master appears um that uh it's 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 really beautiful work and uh is definitely getting overshadowed by the hair metal but it but it should not be overlooked you're absolutely right they were so adaptable in episode four uh coming out of the the credits the piece that they did for when the crew is reassembling back at the headquarters was great. And James said, Hey, can you add in like a little Lalo Schifrin style horns? And the next iteration of that song had it. And it's like, it just up the ante. Yeah, no, they, they should get more love because they did a phenomenal job. Well, you all did. I mean, it's obvious you all loved working on this show, loved working with one another. You brought so much to Peacemaker to make it such an amazing show. I want to thank you guys for joining us today to talk about this. And then certainly, Greg Dorier, you're the first editor that's ever brought props to an audio <laughs> podcast. <laughs> See, I told you they were fun. And they certainly know how to edit a fun series. Please join me in thanking Fred, Greg Single G, and Greg Double G for their time today. Peacemaker is in a class by itself, and so are these guys. 
So make sure to check out the show if you haven't seen it yet. Before we wrap things up today, I wanted to take one more minute to remind you to send me your ideas for future panel episodes of the show. That would be where we get a bunch of editors together to tackle your questions and hot topics as opposed to talking about a film or a TV show. Who knows? Maybe if I use your suggestion, I'll send you a little something. I gotta have a few pieces of avid swag around here somewhere. Even better, maybe we'll come to your house and do the podcast. How about that? You've been cooped up for two years. You can't tell me you wouldn't love to have us come over. All right, maybe not. But send me your ideas all the same. Okay, time to call it done for today's show. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you come back again next time. Until next time, this is Matt Fury thanking you for joining me right here on The Rough Cut.